handed you the scriptures that I'll be referring to today. If you'll take the scripture verses that we already read from 1 Corinthians 11, you can refer back to them as we proceed in our instruction in the Word of God today. We're looking at the breaking of the bread as an act of worship. And so we have some text. In Acts chapter 2, beginning of verse 41 through 47, we have a description of the early church. This would be the first truly, fully, what we would say, New Testament congregation. That is, following the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ into heaven and the descent of the Holy Spirit, the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have gathered together to observe Pentecost, which is one of the feast days. This feast happens a period of time after the Passover that we'll be reading about. And so we have a great congregation of people in Jerusalem from all over the Roman Empire who come for the celebration of the feast. It is upon this occasion that the Lord Jesus sends from heaven His blessed Holy Spirit, the gift of the Father that was promised to them to enable them to be the witnesses to His resurrection and to the establishment of His congregation in the world. Now I say His congregation, the Lord has had His one people from the beginning. All of those who believed in the true God of Scripture and had placed their faith in Him are part of that one people of God. But there's certainly a movement in the advent of the Lord Jesus Christ into the descent of the Holy Spirit. And there is a change. Though we have one people of God, now this people of God are the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're followers of the Messiah. And they constitute what we call and what we experience since that day, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is essentially a assembly, an assembly of believers in Him Amen. who gather together in order to hear His Word and to participate in those ordinances of the gospel that He's given us, namely baptism and the Lord's Supper. It is a fellowship of believers in Jesus Christ who are united to Him by means of the Holy Spirit who dwells in them and who also dwells, obviously, in heaven and in our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Hear what happened. After Peter has preached this glorious message about how Jesus has fulfilled the Scriptures and is therefore the promised Messiah, it says that those who received his word, in verse 41, were baptized. And they were added that day about 3,000. Added 3,000 to the 120 plus believers. Now, we say 120 because we know that so many were assembled in Jerusalem. But there may have been other believers because Paul talks about 500 brethren that saw Christ after his resurrection from the dead. So to let's say that 500 have now been added 3,000. But there may be 120 in Jerusalem, and now these 3,000 are added to them. And they are baptized, each one individually, immersed in water, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as He is commanded in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, what do these people do? Well, they meet together. <laughs> if you're going to have a church, the church has to meet together. <laughs> Because that's what basically the word means. It means an assembly. It means an assembly of those who believe, who gather together for particular actions, to hear from their Lord, to engage in prayer, to listen to His truth, and to participate in the Holy Supper. So it, we read, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and the fellowship, and to the breaking of the bread, and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, 
Many wonders and signs were being done throughout through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as many as had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Yeah. Now let's just look at this text for just a moment. I'm going to draw certain truths to you. There are four activities of this assembly. They are attending to the apostles' teaching. Now basically that consists of preaching, and teaching, preaching, teaching, whichever form it may be, for all preaching should be teaching true to God's Word, and the teaching should be delivered with power, and we therefore call it preaching. In the Old Testament, we had the prophets. In the New Testament, we have the apostles. But the apostles' teaching, now what exactly was the apostles' teaching? Well, our Pastor Jeff has talked about that, but let me summarize it for you. It is essentially two things. It is an instruction from the Old Testament, what we call the First Testament, in how Christ fulfills it. Now, where do they get this information? Well, they got it from the Lord Jesus himself. Amen. He's the one who explained it to them, especially in his post-resurrection appearances. And the second thing it consisted of, telling the actions of Christ when he was here in ministry, who he is and what he did, and interpreting what that means. That, essentially, is the Apostles' teaching. And summarized for us in the early church writings in what is known as the rule of faith, we find it today partly in what we would call the Apostles' Creed. Now, they didn't have the Apostles' Creed then. They did have the statements of Scripture, some of which we read today. And to the fellowship. Now, the fellowship is a broader term, but it's all those things that express the life of the body together. And so Pastor Jeff has explained those to us in previous Sundays, and I will not dwell on those. But part of the fellowship consists of obviously hearing the preaching, but it also consisted of what? Visiting with one another, mm -hmm. sharing their lives together in their homes, and sharing their possessions together, giving to those who had need. All of that consists of the fellowship, the prayers, all these things. So the fellowship, it's the living body of Christ in relationship to Him and in relationship to one another in the bond of love, in the bond of care. And to the breaking of the bread. There are in the Greek here articles, specific articles. Now you don't have to have articles in the Greek, but they're put here because this is the breaking of the bread. Now this, I believe, is here by divine inspiration in order to signify that there is a difference between this breaking of the bread and the common meals that the believers shared together as part of their fellowship, which we read about later in the text where it says they were breaking bread in their homes and received their food with glad and generous hearts. Because you can see in the text that the breaking of bread in their homes is defined by receiving their food with glad and generous hearts. They refer to the same thing. Now, it could be, and probably is, as we read in the Corinthian correspondence, that the early church had meals together, and in those meals, at the conclusion of the meal, they might have what we now call the Lord's Supper. We refer to these as the agape meals, or the love feast, which obviously the Corinthians were seeking to celebrate, though Paul gets on their case because they're not celebrating it correctly. Now, we're going to look at that text in just a moment, but I think there is a distinction here between the breaking of the bread as an act of worship in which we particularly take the bread, and I don't know if it's leavened or unleavened. Christ obviously used unleavened bread for the Passover meal, but that's not the major thing. The major thing is that it be bread and that it be the fruit of the vine, which is either wine or juice of the grape. So we have to have these two things, the two elements are bread and wine. 
And we're going to see what else constitutes the Lord's Supper with that. But this is a particular eating of these particular items as an act of worship. It's part of the activity of worship. Okay? And the last thing is prayers, which we're going to be looking at in the next Sunday. And we'll spend more time in prayer on that particular Lord's Day. So four major activities constitutes the worship events of the church. Now there are other things that Paul will talk about in Corinthians, the sharing of the body, etc., the singing of hymns, all these things in the scriptures, but these are four essential activities of the church. Okay? And so, this is the body of Christ. This is what they do when they gather together. They worship the Lord by paying attention to the teaching of God's Word, which is the Scriptures interpreted in light of the coming of Christ. They have fellowship with Christ and one another. They break bread together in memory of Him, and they pray together as the body of Christ. Now you can pray by specific words. You can pray by singing, which we've done today. Now, I want you to look at Acts 20, verse 17. I've chosen the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which, by the way, I think is an ex a wonderful translation of the Scriptures. But because of the, of the way it's broken down the sentence for us, because it, it, in the Greek it's, it's a, a continuous kind of thing in which you are saying one thing because something else is happening at the same time. But here it's really clear for us. It says, on the first day of the week, we assembled... To break bread. That's, that's why they gathered together. Now, it says Paul spoke to them on this occasion since he was about to depart the next day and he's extended his message into midnight. Now, I'm not going to extend my message into midnight. <laughs> One thing, I'm not Paul. Okay. But we have assembled together to break bread and every Sunday we gather together in order to break bread. The bread of God's word given to us in the reading of it and in the preaching and teaching of it, and in the sharing together of the bread and wine and the actions that Christ gave us to remember Him. This constitutes our Christian worship. And we gather together every Lord's Day in order to do this. Now, I want us to look at the text that was presented to us in Luke 24. I mean, Luke 22, I'm sorry. Luke 22 and then Luke 24. Now I point out Luke 22 because what is Christ doing with his disciples when upon this occasion he institutes what we call the Lord's Supper, a holy meal. Well, what Christ is doing is he's gathered together with his twelve in observance of the Passover, which we read about from Exodus chapter 12. Our Lord Jesus Christ was an observant Hebrew who observed the law. And the law has several feasts that the people of God were to commemorate every year in a yearly cycle. And one of the major ones was the Passover. And Christ did this with his disciples year by year. But this is a particular Passover. It's a very unique Passover. Now why? Because it's the last Passover he will have with him. It's the last celebration he will have of the Passover with his disciples before he fulfills the Passover in his own body in his death upon the cross. The Passover, you see, it commemorates the deliverance of Israel from Egyptian bondage. And how was that deliverance affected? Well, it was affected by the judgment of God upon the Egyptians and the gods the Egyptians worshipped. The Egyptians as the agents of this world and agents of the demonic gods that they serve had Israel under bondage for many hundreds of years. And now the Lord has come to deliver them in accordance with the Abrahamic promise given to us in Genesis chapter 15. And in fulfillment of his word, he now has sent Moses to be the human instrument of his delivering power. 
And so Moses goes in, and after a period of time, when all these ten plagues fall, there comes to the tenth plague, which is the final plague. And that final plague was that God was going to send the angel of avenging judgment upon the Egyptians, upon all the firstborn, both animals and human. Every human and every animal in all of Egypt was under the death sentence of the angel of judgment. But God said to his people, to the Hebrews, in fulfillment of his Abrahamic promise, I want you to take a lamb, and if you kept it about four days, I want you to kill it. Take its blood. I want you to sprinkle that blood, to splash it on certain sections of your door. And I want you to cook that lamb, the whole thing. I want you to burn it. I want you to roast it. Roast it whole. And I want you to get inside your house after you put the blood on it. And I want you to eat that lamb with bitter herbs and with unleavened bread. And you're to stay in that house all the night until the next morning. Don't venture out. Because I'm sending the angel of judgment upon the land. Those who are in the house under the blood, eating on the lamb, will be spared. Their lives will be spared. All who are outside will die, the firstborn of animal and humans. And thus it came to pass. And what did Israel do? Well, Israel acted in faith. They, they got that lamb. They kept him around for four days. They killed him. They shed his blood. They put it on their household. They cooked that meat. They got those herbs ready in that bread. They stayed in their house until the next morning. They could hear the cries of the Egyptians throughout the night. The braying of the animals. The firstborn died throughout the land. But their firstborn lived. And in the next day, God brings them out with a mighty hand. Pharaoh lets them go and they head for the promised land. Now we're not going to go about all the trials. That's another thing. This is what happened. Now it's in celebration of this. God said every year I want you to remember this. I want you to remember what I've done. And so Christ is gathered with his disciples on this particular Passover and he says to them I have longed to eat this Passover with you. He told his disciples, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. And so everything was done in preparation according to the law. And when the hour came, he reclined at table, the apostles with him. Now we, we don't quite picture this in our minds correctly because we sit at a table in our chairs, but they, were, they ate reclining sort of on a little very small table toward the floor. Think about uh, Japanese people and how they might eat mm. on the very small tables. That's the way they ate. And so they're not sitting like we are. They're sort of laying, laying, reclining as they eat the meal. So the hour came and he reclined at table and the apostles were with him. There are 12 of them. Now there's some other people in there, by the way, but these are the 12 at the table with him. They're reclining with him. And he says to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now, the bill begins. In the Luke account, we have the, big, the Passover. Jesus is obviously having Passover with his disciples. This is what the text says. And at the beginning of your meal, you take a cup of wine. It's called the cup of sanctification. It begins the meal. And he has this one cup, and he says, take this and divide it among yourselves. So it's the sharing this cup. For I tell you that from now on, I'll not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So they began the Passover meal the way they always did, with the sanctification cup. 
Now, it's later in the meal that he does something totally you, unique. It's never been done before. Toward the conclusion of the meal, but not at the end, he takes bread, just the bread that was there on the table, the unleavened bread, and he offers it up to God and gives a prayer of thanks, which was common. He then took that same bread and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now this is way off the chart. This has never been done before. He is taking bread and proclaiming an identity of himself with this bread. Now, Christians have debated what all that means. We we're going to let the debate stay. We we're going to let the text say for what it says. Jesus gave him bread and he said, This is my body which is given for you. Now, he hadn't become that bread. Physically, he's still with them. But this bread is in some kind of union with him. Okay? So they take it. I'm sure they're absolutely astonished. They're not sure what's coming next. But he says, this is my body which is given for you. And after they've eaten, he takes a cup. A cup of wine. Now they usually have traditionally four cups of wine. This could be the third cup of wine. Maybe the last. He takes this cup of wine and now he holds the wine up. He says this cup is poured out for you. That is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. He says I'm instituting the new covenant. He is proclaiming fulfillment of Jeremiah 31 and other passages that refer to the new covenant. This cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. The blood that was shed on the, in Israel and placed on the doorpost. He's saying, I am the fulfillment of the Passover. I am the Lamb. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Take it. Drink from it all of you. This is a new ordinance. We call this subsequently the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, the Eucharist, the Lord's Table. We have a lot of names for it. All of them are biblical, by the way. <laughs> And so we'll look at them briefly. And then he goes on because the action is now being put into play. His betrayer will be revealed and will go out. Christ himself will lead the disciples in prayer. They'll retire to the Mount of Olives. And from there, in a few hours, he will be arrested. He will be stripped and beaten and ultimately hung on a cross and will die. All of this will occur within the next 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Now obviously, this is an earth-shattering event and he has tied it to this simple meal he institutes, bread and wine, given in his name and to be eaten and drunk in remembrance of him. Okay, now let us turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. All I'm trying to lay out for you is the teaching of Scripture concerning the Lord's Supper as a holy meal. And as we go along, we're going to ask some questions of the text and see what the answer is. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. Now this is several years later. Because when Christ instituted this meal, Paul, who Saul, Saul and Paul, actually are the same thing, it's just Hebrews, one's Hebrew, one's Greek. Same guy, same name, but one of them, he was lost at one day, and later he's going to be a Christian. One of the greatest saints, but he was all before that one of the greatest sinners. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. At this point, Saul didn't know anything about the Lord Jesus. He might have heard of him. Probably did. He probably didn't have much use for him. And we know later he hated him. And he hunted down his disciples to kill them. But God arrested him. The Lord Jesus Christ arrested him in grace in the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. And he became one of the greatest apostles of the Christian faith. Now he's writing to the Corinthians, a church that he had helped establish some years before. He'd spent 18 months with these people and established the church strong on a strong foundation. But now he's away from them and he is possibly in prison when he writes this. I didn't check all that out particular the time he wrote it. But he writes back to them because he's received some information about what's going on in Corinth. He's concerned and he wants to straighten out the problems that are there. One of the problems has to do with the way they are conducting the agape meal, the fellowship meal, and the Lord's Supper. Obviously in Corinth they are sort of combined together. Now this does not mean that this was true in every church throughout the empire. We make assumptions that every church did it the same way. But that's an assumption. We know this is how Corinth was doing it. He doesn't write these words to other churches. So presumably they were not messing up in the area where the Corinthians were. They may have been, but, but he, he wants to set them straight about how you do the Lord's Supper. Whether you have it combined with the agape meal or not, there's certain things we need to do and keep in mind. Now, I want us to go back to the Acts account, and I want to take up terminology about the Lord's Supper. Okay? And I've used Luke's account, by the way, because Luke Acts is the same author, Luke Acts, and he's the one who uses this term, the breaking of the bread. We don't find that in the others. So this is a unique term to Paul and Luke. Now, Luke was a companion to Paul. He traveled with Paul. And so we can see that his account of the Lord's Supper institution is what's being reflected, in large part, by Paul's writing. Now, there's also Matthew's account and Mark's account, which are essentially the same thing, but it doesn't have the narrative about the Passover, at least not the detail. But I want you to notice that the church uh, has the... The four activities of worship, one of which is what? The breaking of the bread. In Acts 20, verse 17, it says on the first day of the week we assembled to break bread. So the whole purpose of the gathering was to break bread. Now often we think in our modern day, well, to gather with the other two, we can sing songs, quote, worship God. Now, worshiping God is far more than singing songs. It used to be, 50, 60 years ago, they thought preaching was the whole thing. Nowadays, pe people think singing's the whole thing. The truth of the matter is, you need to have both along with prayer and the Lord's Supper if you want to have a biblical, <laughs> biblical service of worship. And all of it is worship. The prayers, the preaching, the listening, the giving, the singing, the praying, everything you do in the name of the Lord to focus upon the teaching of God's Word for the edification of the people of God. But notice... That Luke also uses this term about the breaking of the bread in Luke 24. Now, I do not believe that Jesus actually did the Lord's Supper with the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. But the significance of it is the use of the term, the breaking of the bread. You know, this is on the resurrection day. It's in the evening of resurrection. And Jesus catches up with two of his disciples as he's walking along the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus, about 11 miles. They're walking long walk. He travels along with him. He keeps him from seeing exactly who he is. And he has him explain to them why they're upset, why they're depressed. And he says that after they went through all this, and he shows to himself that, he, that Christ is being fulfilled in the scriptures by his death and resurrection. Okay? And so they say, well, don't go, don't leave. Come on, come in with us and come search, come supper with us. It's supper time. Let's, let's, let's get together and have a, have a meal. Mm. And so he goes in to uh, have a meal with them. And when he was at table with them, we read in verse 30, he took the bread, 
That was just a common action to take bread. He blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. That's the same actions he did at the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. It's also the action he did when he fed the 5,000 or the 4,000. Mm -hmm. He took bread, lifted it up to heaven and gave a prayer of thanks and began to break it and share it with the people. The point of it is Luke is saying that this action, this familiar action, this breaking of the bread, they suddenly realize this is Jesus in our midst. Their eyes were open and they recognized him and he immediately vanished from their sight. Well, I don't know if they finished that bill or not. It says that they got up and they hurried back to Jerusalem. And they kept talking to each other. Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and when he opened us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. I bet they went there quicker than they had originally. And they found the eleven. Now why is there eleven? Because Judas has gone out. There's only eleven true disciples of the Lord Jesus. And those who were with him gathered together. There's more than the eleven. And they burst into the room where they're meeting and said, The Lord is risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. That's what the people were saying. And these Emmaus disciples told them what had happened to them on the road and how it was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now here we have a, a purpose of the Lord's Supper. It's to make known Christ Amen. It's to make known Him who is the fulfillment of all God's promises. Him who is the Passover Himself. The Passover fulfillment is not the Lord's Supper meal, but it is Jesus Himself who is the Passover Lamb. We take the holy meal in remembrance of Him, the true Passover lamb. And so the Lord's Supper has been a most precious sign and act of worship with the Christian church, with Christian believers, since the day that Christ first instituted it and then was raised from the dead. Now, it's in light of all this that we come to the observance of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11. Now, sometimes we talk about the Last Supper and the Lord's Supper. Let me tell you the distinction. The Last Supper is the historical Passover Christ had with his disciples that we read about in Luke 22. Okay? But the Lord's Supper is the continuing ritual, because that's what it is. It's a ritual. A formal action of taking bread and wine, consecrating it with prayer, repeating the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, and sharing it together. It's a simple action, but it is loaded with significance. Now this is the Lord's Supper. Now Paul begins his discussion in 1 Corinthians 11 with a statement. You see, the, the church was gathered together, what? They assembled together to have the Lord's Supper. And he begins to say, in the following instructions, I do not want to commend you. Because you know when you get together, it's not for the best, it's for the worst. Now why do we say that? Lord, that's a pretty bad indictment, isn't it? To say when a church gets together, that what you're doing is not really edifying. You're, you're not. And the reason is because of what they were doing, how they were doing it. Now this is the agape meal, because the church is gathering together, and they're sharing a common meal together. But in the midst of this common meal, probably at the conclusion of it, they had what we would call the Lord's Supper. But they, they're sort of mixed here. And so, it is the Lord's table, and it is the Lord's Supper. Both of these terms are being used, okay? When you come together as a church, as an assembly, the first problem is there are divisions among. Now those divisions he's talked about earlier, they're divisions over leadership, people having different people they like better than others, previous pastors, 
it's always hard to follow somebody else. And secondly, there were social and economic divisions among the people. There were Hellenistic Jews. There were the Gentiles. They were all in this church. They didn't let their distinctions dissolve its one in Christ. They kept a hold of them. And it's reflected in how they ate. Mm. You know, who you eat with says mm. a lot about you. Mm. There are divisions among you. And I, and I believe it's true because there are factions among you. And the reason God allows factions is for Him to let us see who's genuine and who's false. Heresies come among us to see who has the true faith and who has a false faith. He says, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Now, they came together expressively to eat the Lord's Supper. But he's saying because of your actions, it's really not the Lord's Supper. You've turned it into something else. You've turned it into a, a pagan feast. Paul doesn't like pagan feasts. Now, here is what I mean, he says. This is what I mean. Because when you gather together for the church, people bring their meal, people, different people bring food. It's a potluck, okay? That's what it is, potluck. Somebody brings a lot and somebody brings a little. Some bring, brings good stuff, brings others not so good stuff. And they arrive at different times. The people that have affluence and, and, and goods, they arrive early. And they can start their meal right away. They're not waiting around with other group. They have those poor laborers that have to wait later to come. They go and start eating. They have a lot of food to eat, a lot of wine to drink, and so they start eating. They're not waiting on their brothers to arrive so that it's be a meal of unity. It's a meal of division. Paul says that's not the way it should be. Look, if that's all you're going to do, why don't you just stay home? You have houses to eat in, don't you? Eat and drink in your house. Don't do that in the house of the Lord. Don't despise God's house by showing distinctions among yourselves that should not be there. God has made one people through the blood of Christ. And He has dissolved these distinctions of the rich and poor, the socially affluent, and those who are the nobodies. In Christ, we're all somebody. Somebody he's loved and somebody he's redeemed by his blood. And you be sure you show that in how you gather together. Now, James takes up the same issue in his epistle. So do not despise the church of God, the assembly of God's people, and humiliate those who don't have as much as others. Don't do that. Can I commend you in this? Now, I won't use the expletive, but he says, no. <laughs> now, he goes on, he's going to straighten it out. For what? For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. Notice, he didn't make this up. The Apostle Paul did not establish the Lord's Supper. He is ha passing on the holy tradition. Mm -hmm. This is probably one of the earliest sections of inspired writing in Scripture because it's part of the oral tradition that began on the day Christ instituted it in the upper room. I received this from the Lord, and I've delivered it to you. On the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And we had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, the Lord Jesus did four actions. These are the four essential actions for a scriptural a biblical celebration of the Lord's Supper. Now you can have other things, but these four are essential. Bread and wine. Okay, bread are the fruit of the fruit of the vine. You got bread and you got a cup, and you're gonna pour a cup, liquid in that cup. It comes from the grapes, the fruit of the vine. We know it was wine. Why? Because the Corinthians got drunk on it. 
Mm -hmm. I've never seen anybody get drunk on grape juice, have you? <laughs> <laughs> they, they kept drinking and eating, and you know, if you keep, if your meal lasts a couple of hours and you keep eating and drinking along, then you're going to get a little woozy, right? Mm -hmm. That, God doesn't approve of that. The Apostle Paul rebuked it, okay? Okay, so he takes the bread and the wine, separate, not together. He gives thanks. Prayer of thanksgiving. He breaks the bread, and obviously he pours the wine, or it's already poured, so the cup. He passes the bread and tells him to eat it. Eat from it. And the cup, and drink from it. So each one has... A bite. It could be a substantial bite. It doesn't have to be the little bitty things we eat. Mm -hmm. And it could be a substantial swallow. Mm. Okay? But there are two actions. You break the bread and eat it. And you drink from the cup. He didn't dip the bread in the cup. <laughs> mm -hmm. Two separate actions. Both of which are set apart with prayer. And both of which are participating in by you consuming it. You have not eaten the Lord's Supper by looking at it. You eat the Lord's Supper when you eat the bread and drink from the cup. Two actions. Two elements. With this interpretation that Jesus lays down. This bread and this cup is for you to do in remembrance of me. Personal me. <laughs> in other words, this bread, this cup, this is me. Now he hadn't become the bread or cup. But it is so associated with him that when we look at it, when we participate in it, he is who is to be in our mind. He is present. Do this in remembrance of me, my person, not just my death. He didn't say, do this to remember my death. We are remembering his death, but primarily we're, what? we're remembering him, the living yeah. Lord. Okay? And the second, the new covenant in my blood. Now, Matthew and Mark fill us in for the forgiveness of our sins. Mm -hmm. His blood is shed so that God can justly forgive us of our sins. So when we partake of the cup, we should remember that Christ's blood was shed for me. You should say this, for me. You know that my sins, as black and ugly as they are, can and are forgiven. The sign of the bread and cup is to tell us God has forgiven us and He's done so justly, not by any actions we have done, but by the actions of the Passover Lamb, Jesus Christ Himself, who took our sins in His own body on the tree. He has borne the judgment against us and therefore we are free. It's an act of grace. Pure, simple, 100%, altogether grace. You do not earn worthiness to partake of the Lord's Supper. Christ has made you worthy if you believe in Him. The only requirement he has is that you've embraced him by faith. Now what about weighing these statements that Paul's going to get to of an unworthy matter? Well, let's look what the text says. He goes back to what? How they're doing the meal. <laughs> we don't make ourselves worthy to take the Lord's Supper, but we can participate in it in an unworthy manner. 
Okay, how we can do it can be screwed up. That's what he's saying. Okay, now how do you screw up observance of the Lord's Supper? Well, two ways. When you combine it with a regular meal, if we don't wait for one another, you know, sometimes when we sit down to eat together, someone is so ready to eat, they're ready to plunge in and eat without us even having prayer. Well, look, that, that's sort of being like focusing on me. I look, I want to get on with this. Well, it's community, it's doing it together. Together. So that's what he's getting on to them. You eat and drink in an unworthy manner when you don't wait for your brother and sister in this agape meal. You go on and eat and drink without regard to them. It's to be a unity meal, not you take a snack and somebody else takes a snack. You know, there are some churches that, that put the Lord's elements of the supper side on the table and you can take them if you want as you go in or out. Now that's totally unbiblical. The Lord's Supper is not us running in for a little snack. <laughs> it's a ceremony. It's a ritual to be done together. Now, we don't have to have a meal with it. If we do have a meal with it, then we need to pay attention to how we have that meal together. But if we just have the simple meal, the bread and wine only, we need to have a proper attitude, a proper mindset. That's what he's saying. So, if we do it in an unworthy manner, we're guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. So there are two things going on here, two sins he's talking about. The sin against the body of Christ as the church. When we do not have regard for our fellow believer in how we do the Lord's Supper, or how we do the agape meal with or without the Lord's Supper. We must have regard for one another. If not, we are dishonoring the Lord's body, i.e. the assembly, the church that he's redeemed by the blood. And secondly, if we take of the Lord's Supper without meaning, without discerning its meaning, then we are drinking judgment to ourselves. In other words, we're taking holy things and treating them as, as something that's unholy. It's something that's just, oh, you know, it's, 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 you don't do that with God's things. He has given us bread and wine in a sacred ceremony signifying his body and blood. And he is our host. He is with us by the Holy Spirit. And somehow, spiritually, we by faith partake of Him who is our life and our salvation. That Christians have argued about how that exactly is done. And I can tell you, I don't know. But I do know that I believe it. That it is so united with Christ's person and what he's done for us. That when I eat and drink this bread and wine in remembrance of him with faith, Christ himself feeds my soul and spirit with himself. Amen. That's what we must see in the supper. Nothing else. Now Paul says, you know, there's some, there's some penalties attached to being unworthy in how we handle the Lord's things. You can come under a judgment of God. Now this doesn't send you to hell, by the way. It's pointing it out. It's a temporary judgment. And the reason God gives it to you is so that you don't go to hell. <laughs> I mean, that's what it says. It says that here's the result. If you eat and drink without discerning the Lord's body, either the body of the church or the body that's in the bread and wine, then you're going to come under judgment. And the judgment can make you weak. Mm -hmm. Physically and spiritually, you're weak. It can make you ill. Physically and spiritually, you can be ill. And you can even die. Now, hopefully that doesn't happen a whole lot. But he, he's pointing out to us 
that the temporary judgments of God that come into our lives as believers when we don't do things right is so that we'll not be condemned along with the world. The temporary judgment doesn't atone for sin. It just straightens out a child of God. That's what it's meant to do. So, let's review. The terms for the Lord's Supper that the Scripture gives us. I'm just going to run through them. The breaking of the bread, which is obviously rooted in the action that Christ did, and which we do in the ceremony. It's also called the Lord's Supper, that is, it's the Lord's meal, the Lord's Supper. And it's also called, in 1 Corinthians 10, 21, the Lord's Table. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 10, 21. Did I have that on your paper? Yes, I did. Right in the middle of the paper. 1 Corinthians 10, 19 through 21. Now this is also where I'm coming up the fact that we, yes, the Lord's Supper is a memorial, but it seems to be more than just a memorial. It's not just, it's not that we have the Lord present by having Him in our memory. Look, Christ is a living Lord. He's not some dead person in a cemetery. We go out there to remember that He used to live among us. He's the living Lord reigning in heaven and who also lives in our lives by the presence of the Holy Spirit. So when the Apostle Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, what do I imply then? He's talking about how we eat food and if we go and eat food that's been sacrificed to idols. He doesn't approve of that. <laughs> now if you don't know it's been sacrificed to an idol, it's all right, eat up. But if you know it's been sacrificed to an idol, it's been used in the worship of idols, and it's something to do with idols, then don't eat it. So what do I imply then, he says in verse 19, that food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No. There's no reality to an idol. The food offered to idols is nothing but just food. But it's been associated with demons. No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. Paul, Jesus, the New Testament does not ever want us to mix the worship of God with demonic things, with the worship of demons. And idol worship, pagan worship, in whatever form, is idolatry. And idolatry is rooted in in the demonic. I do not want you to be participants with demons. Okay? Now, why? Can I, can I run down there to the pagan temple and have a nice meal with my neighbors that they worship, you know, Zeus or whoever he may be, and then also come to the Lord's house and, and have the Lord's supper with you? And Paul says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. So you choose who you're going to serve. You eat from their table. Don't mix them. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. So notice the table of the Lord. There's another name for the Lord's Supper, right? And the cup of the Lord. Okay, so this is where we get this terminology. This is a biblical terminology. But notice that what he says, that just like eating that pagan food that's been sacrificed to idols, you're participating with idols. When you eat the Lord's table, his bread and his cup, you are participating with the Lord. Yeah. It's a participation of life. It's not just a memory. It's a participation spiritually with the Lord. This is why we say in the classic words of institution. Take and eat or take and drink. Take and drink. Take and eat this bread. Take and eat this. And feed upon Christ in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. We're receiving Him spiritually because it's through faith through faith we believe, and through faith we partake of Christ. And what does it testify to us? It testifies to the death of our Lord, yes, but more than that, 
to the meaning of his death for you, for me. Take and eat this, for Christ is your life, and his blood is the forgiveness of your sins. This is what the Lord's table is all about. And now we turn to eat and drink. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the holy meal, which he has given to us. In so doing, we will give a prayer of thanks, which is Eucharist. That's what Eucharist means. We will have participation and fellowship with one another and with Christ. We will be remembering what Christ has done for us. We remember him in his blessed person, risen and ascended to the right hand of the Father. We will take to ourselves the sign of the new covenant, knowing that Christ himself has brought about this covenant and this covenantal relationship with him. And in so doing, we will proclaim Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection for us and for all who believe on him. Let us come to the table.